Olá a todas e todos. Este é mais uma vez o BDF Entrevista Internacional. Uma vez por mês trazemos figuras políticas internacionais para debater temas globais. Hoje temos um programa muito especial. Nós trazemos aqui o editor em chefe do Itlix, Christian Ramson. Well, it's nice to have you here with us, Mr. Ramson. I'm honored to be here. Christian Ramson é jornalista investigativo e editor-chefe do Wikileaks desde 2010. Antes disso, se destacou na imprensa da Islândia, especialmente na cobertura sobre o derretimento da economia do país diante da crise dos bancos de 2008. Em 2010, foi ao Iraque fazer uma investigação das ações dos Estados Unidos, publicada no Wikileaks como Collateral Damage. So, uh, the first question I want to make... Uh... I want to start this debate if we can you, if you can access the legacy of WikiLeaks work uh, regarding journalism uh, and the sense of the importance when we look at the global violence interventions and wars since the beginning of the 2000s how do you see the legacy of WikiLeaks works I think, I think the legacy of WikiLeaks uh, will, in historical terms, when uh, people reflect back, uh, be quite uh, extraordinary. And it, it comes on many layers. If you think of the, about this, uh, this period of, of this century, uh, there's always a difficulty putting some starting point in an era. But let's say a, a certain era started in 9-11 uh, with the attack on, 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 the, on the United States. What followed was a, 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 a dark spin in politics and uh, uh, an attack on human rights uh, in Western countries and also these horrible wars that followed uh, the, in Afghanistan and Iraq and then the, the drone wars in several countries and what have you. So it, it marked a turning point in, in global politics which uh, uh, was undermining uh, the uh, the uh, security of individuals in, in in many aspects. We see attacks on on on, uh, on press freedom. We see uh, see attack on privacy. We see, of course, direct violence, military violence, and police violence. This is happening all over the world, and this is instigated by this uh, attack by this one man in the cave in Afghanistan. As I would say. Secrecy by Western powers increased dramatically. You can see that in, in basically graphs on, on, for example, on, on the amount of documents that were put into secrecy category in the United States. We saw corporate secrecy increased as well. So on all level there was a decline and journalism did not have the right answer for it. The introduction of the scientific uh, journalism that Julian Assange created with the, the website and the idea that uh, we can push back by creating a platform for whistleblowers to submit information, raw information, that can then be analyzed and published in entirety. I say scientific because that's the scientific method to basically provide the raw material to the individual so they can double check and in investigate by themselves. But of course, also we had went into this cooperation with uh, uh, mainstream media uh, and media all over the world, uh, and even French media or whatever you call it, to analyze the material that was published. So it was an explosion watershed, I would say, in terms of journalism. Uh, the publications of the files from Iraq and Afghanistan, I'm referring to the military files, the 250,000 docu documents from the Department of State in the US, the diplomatic cables, uh, the files from uh, uh, the, the assessment files of the inmates in Guantanamo Bay, it, it, it ripped open a totally new reality. And the impact, of course, was tremendous in political terms. Uh, and uh, I think we are seeing a changed world after that. Of course, the political impact was uh, was uh, uh, quite obvious. It uh, it uh, in the beginning it it, it sparked a, a process or or, or helped uh, uh, escalate the what we call now the Arab Spring, but uh, or the Arab Awakening, uh, and it uh, it caused into question the legitimacy of this uh, uh, abuse of the empire of its position. It also created material for a lot of people to actually get justice that had not been deprived of justice, of war crimes or renditions 
Uh, so the material that we published has been used in uh, to get some form of justice for those who were wronged, to end the impunity of, uh, of war crimes and, uh, and illegal acts against, uh, for example, rendition people. It was used, in, uh, for example, in the El Masri case in, in the European Court of Human Rights and was a very important document and proof. Uh, the documents from the diplomatic cable can be said to have led to the final withdrawals of all troops from Iraq uh, because the Iraqi government, uh, after there was some elements were established in the, uh, in the diplomatic cables about uh, uh, wrongdoing and cover-up of, of abuses in the country after 2003, uh, the, the government in Iraq could not lo no longer uh, provide the U.S. military with uh, um, uh, a commitment of total sanctuary for all wrongdoing, and that led to the withdrawal of troops from Iraq. But the other important story, uh, which is often over overlooked because it's ongoing, is uh, uh, the uh, exposure which are inherent in the reaction by the United States of America and other countries that are collaborating with the U.S., and how they responded to this, these leaks. And, and that is a, a, a very important story that is still ongoing with the imprisonment of Julian Assange, with the uh, attack on, 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 on the organization and other who work for the organization. That is an ongoing story and the proof of uh, how uh, far the uh, superpower is willing to go in the act of revenge is astonishing and that story, the reaction story, will probably be in historical terms as important story as, uh, of the Wikileaks story. It is the action and then the reaction and that often happens in journalism. I mean the most famous example of course is, is, is Watergate. It was not the stealing of the papers but it was the cover-up and the lies and the break-in into the Watergate building uh, and the cover-up and the lies about it that, that caused uh, the resignation of Nixon. So you have, and that is of course the ongoing story that we are dealing with at the moment, uh, which we would happily be without because as journalists we want to be just to be doing our jobs. But this is now happened to me, my job and my colleagues to put all the emphasis that we have on trying to end this persecution and this violence against Julian Assange and this lawfare that is ongoing uh, because we recognize as all major organizations in the world today that this is a, an attack not just on Julian and Wikileaks, it's an attack on press freedom worldwide. Uh, so if I may, uh, you mentioned Watergate and that was a famous case of, of exposure. If you could elaborate a little bit more on that uh, thinking about context, what it is different from the 70s in, in concerning actually also what you said about the persecution or the reaction to journalists and, and journalist, uh, uh, journalistic endeavors in the 70s and in the 2000s? Well, the comparison is, is uh, chilling in many respects because we, I think we tend to look back at the 70s as being the dark period of, of, of Nixon era where the bad things happened. But actually the Nixon era and the bad things happening in, in, in that, that uh, framework of time is much less severe than what we are witnessing today. So it, we are in a much more precarious situation the, uh, and journalism uh, and, and, uh, the, uh, is under much severe attack today than it was back in the day. Uh, and I, just as an illustration, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who was the uh, person who leaked the Pentagon Papers in the same period and indirectly had a, a, an effect on, on, the, on the Nixon re uh, resignation, told me, because he's a huge supporter and he came to London, and uh, he said that if I had been doing uh, what I did as a whistleblower today instead of in the early 70s, I would have never seen a, a day as a free man. I would never have been uh, gotten off. They would have locked me up for the rest of my life under the certain regime, under the certain, uh, the, the same sort of situation that Julian Assange deal with. So we are, and that's a chilling thing to say. We haven't progressed, we have regressed. We are now at a worst 
worse state of, uh, than, than, uh, than 50 years ago. So uh, we, you already started talking about this, but if you, so we talk about the legacy of Wikileaks. What are the challenges should they? And we can think about important things that happened a year ago, uh, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan in a terrible way. We have the Ukrainian war now. How Wikileaks, but not only Wikileaks, journalists, uh, 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 initiatives can help maybe can, can help build, I would say, a more peaceful world, or if not peaceful, a more accountable world. I agree with Julian Assange when he said that our primary aim should be to stop wars, not just to expose the wrongdoing in wars. And uh, we, we are not there yet, uh, we have to admit that. You talk about the Afghanistan, which is the, the longest uh, war that the US uh, has uh, entered into, ended in a rather humiliating uh, manner for them after billions of dollars of, of uh, expenses and the human cost in human lives that is of course you cannot count in, in monetary value. If people had paid more attention to uh, the Afghan files that were published in 2010 this would have ended sooner. It would have been 10-12 years instead of 20 years because there was nothing new in the evaluation that led to the decision, okay, let's end it. Uh, that was not already there in the files 10 years earlier. So th this is, a, in, in fact, a bit disappointing that it was not, uh, 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 did not create more attention to actually uh, quicken the end of this horrible spectacle that was not going anywhere. Uh, how can we uh, contribute to uh, 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 preventing wars? It is a difficult situation and it is getting more and more difficult because uh, there is a, are forces in play in our societies internationally that uh, are working against uh, any chance of, 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 uh, of that becoming a success. So I would like to know your opinion on something we can maybe call a new phenomenon, right? Which is fake news. And in Brazil we had this experience, especially in 2018, right? maybe less on, on this last election, but uh, Bolsonaro was elected in 2018, not only because of that, but that was, gave a push for him, fake news. Uh, how journalists or how we as journalists should look at that, especially when you're talking about Wikileaks, which is a project that uh, uh, it's, it's so careful to talk about the truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the problem is, is humongous. It's, it's, a, it's a massive, uh, massive problem and it's not a, just a Brazilian problem, it's a universal problem. It is something that is being uh, hurting people everywhere in the world and the democratic process. Um, and it's not easy to deal with it because it's easy to fall into a trap, a trap of uh, introducing a medicine that will kill the patient. We do not want that. Uh, we do not want uh, uh, to get into a, a, a place where we are increasing uh, censorship to, to stop fake news. That is uh, uh, conflicting uh, uh, agendas that, that will not lead to a good thing in my opinion. I am very wary of all um, uh, sort of attempts to, to divert in that direction. But the problem is certainly there, and the problem, of course, we know where it springs from. Uh, you, you talked about the right. Yes, the right, uh, the right wing is the, uh, the, the general uh, principal actor in, in the spreading of disinformation. But they are not the only one. And the mainstream media, even on the liberal left, uh, have bear some responsibility to have followed suit in that, uh, that shouting out of, of, uh, of uh, or spreading of disinformation. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the powers uh, in, in, uh, in our world are certainly not innocent in the field as well. Uh, and it is taken very seriously uh, as a weapon uh, by intelligence agencies, for example, to use this information to actively push out a certain agenda. Uh, and that is part of the propaganda war. So they are guilty as well of, of adding to that problem. 
and uh, all too many journalists fall into the trap of, of being uh, manipulated by these uh, powers. You say it's a, a new thing. I, I don't think in general it's a new thing. It's always been there to some extent, but it, in the scale of it and the, and the political seriousness that of course is, is uh, uh, escalated by the fact that we do have these new actors in the field or new elements in the field, the technology, to spread information is, is uh, way uh, bigger and, and more effective than before. And uh, then we have the social media who are becoming uh, way too uh, uh, powerful in, in the social sphere. It is, I, I, I've been watching with, with some, some amazement the stories, for example, lately about uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, taking over Twitter. and. Everybody is shouting and screaming on the liberal left and uh, in, in the mainstream about how serious this is for democracy. And I said, this is the wrong question. You should be asking, why does it matter that some crazy American owns a social media platform? How did we allow and what can we do about the fact that these platforms are so instrumental in our democratic process, if correct? And is that an unhealthy position per se? Should we do something about that? We need to zoom out and, and, and see the problem in entirety. So the problem is not Elon Musk. It's this, the problem is that social media plays such a huge role in our, our democratic process, opening the way to, uh, to abuse uh, and, and uh, strong propaganda to basically poison our process. And one thing to add, uh, uh, so when we are we are dealing with forces that are, in essence, anti-democratic. And that's, let's be, to be ba basically clear about that. You know, I, don't, I don't really care what we call it, what label we put on it, whether it's here in, in Brazil or in, in the US or, or elsewhere, whether you call it uh, uh, neo-fascist, fascist, neo-conservative or ultra-right or what have you. It is a, a, a common problem, it's a common theme and it's everywhere rising. Uh, and, and drowning out uh, the political sphere, and that this is an anti-democratic force. So uh, one of uh, all those things we discussed, one of the most important things regarding freedom of speech and accountability is the persecution and arrest of, of Julian Assange right now. So first my question would be if you could give us briefly uh, the, the current situation of, of Assange's situation. Well, his situation is very precarious. Uh, uh, if we just look at the individual and the personality and his health situation, it is declining, as is natural and normal for somebody who has de been deprived of freedom for all this time under this ex ex immense pressure. Julian has been deprived of uh, full freedom for you know 12 years now. Uh, house arrest, uh, asylum in the Ecuador embassy, without any access to daylight or exercise outdoors for seven years and now three and a half years uh, in, in a maximum security prison in, in London waiting and fighting against the extradition. So that is his, his situation is not good. His health has declined and uh, it should not be a, um, which is expected of, of somebody who has endured so much. Legally, he is now fighting against uh, the extradition in the court uh, and we are now waiting for the uh, High Court in London to uh, uh, evaluate the, the request for an appeal. We fully appreciate, uh, or fully, fully expect that this will be a, a, they will hear the appeal. It would be scandalous if they would not hear the appeal. Uh, the, the answer to that question will come in the next days or weeks. Uh, and then uh, there will be a court case and hearing and in that hearing, all the, uh, the most serious stories of, uh, of violations against Julian will be, for the first time, heard in an appeal court. And with the added evidence that have come since the first round, for example, the news report that the CIA was plotting to kidnap or kill Julian in the Ecuador embassy in 2017, which by itself should be enough to prove that he will not no stand a chance of any fair trial in the United States and therefore the extradition should collapse. So this is the, the situation that uh, if everything goes 
to the worst, uh, he might be on a plane, rendition plane to the U.S. in the next weeks. So time is running out for us. We don't, and uh, we have to, we have to take into account the worst case scenario. So that is the reason why we are taking uh, an increased step on uh, on uh, getting on board as many political uh, forces as possible to solve this on a political platform, because in the essence of it, it has nothing to do with the laws. That is what has been exposed in all these proceedings in London courtroom. Uh, despite the facade of, of, of justice in a, in a very fancy courtrooms with judges with the wigs on their heads, what has been exposed through the entire process that this has nothing to do with the law. It's a pure political persecution. If you could uh, explain to me briefly, you mentioned this, there is a lawsuit against Mike Pompeo, right, from, yeah. from Spanish courts regarding this uh, assassinate attempt against Assange. Well, actually, there are several lawsuits where, 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 where Mike Pompeo is implicated. Uh, one is by Julian's uh, uh, lawyers uh, and journalists who were visiting him in the embassy and who were spied upon by the CIA when uh, Mike Pompeo was director of the, the agency. And of course, he later be, became uh, the Secretary of State in Trump's government. So he is, he is implicated in that case. That's an American case, which is launched in America. And, uh, and uh, Mike Pompeo has been subpoenaed to, to appear in the, that court case. Uh, there is another case ongoing in Madrid, and that is against the security company that worked on behalf of the CIA in installing all this uh, spying on, on, on Julian and everybody who visited him uh, uh, and broke the rights of him, his rights, and all, everybody who visited. That case is in, in the courts in Madrid and is ongoing. In that case, uh, uh, the, the uh, magistrate uh, judge in, uh, in, uh, in Madrid has uh, uh, requested Mike Pompeo's present, presence uh, as former director of the CIA as it is obvious that he must have had uh, knowledge and approve of, uh, of this uh, outrageous operation. So there are many fronts to fight on and uh, uh, in the push back uh, revelations have come forth which are you know astonishing in this time and age. Uh, astonishing. So when you you mentioned so in the beginning you mentioned the reaction <coughs> against uh, WikiLeaks and this kind of, of journalism enterprise and, and now you mentioned about the espionage of some cases. Uh, can we say, and, and I mentioned, for example, the scandal of the spy, uh, Pegasus spyware, an Israeli app that uh, was, uh, uh, revealed was uh, spying on journalists and activists. That th this would be part of the reaction. I mean, governments and even corporations may be trying to spy and persecute people like, uh, like Assange? Yeah, governments, corporations and government in, in collusion with uh, corporations. Uh, that, is, that is the ongoing trend that is, uh, that is uh, uh, extremely serious and needs to be addressed. Yes, that, is, that is, has been ongoing. Of course, the revelation of Edward Snowden, uh, which we helped him to get to security, was uh, astonishing, especially to Americans who were rather sensitive to, uh, to spying on their, on, their, on their private matters. But uh, these, uh, these uh, elements uh, have been growing and it's a part of the same trend. It did not stop in 2010, it escalated in 2010. But this, it, it was a trend that had started uh, earlier and uh, uh, unfortunately, for example, it, it didn't seem to matter who was uh, in, in uh, the White House at the time, whether it was a Democrat or Republican. Uh, it manifested, for example, in the outrageous escalation in, under the Obama administration in their war against whistleblowers. And I mean, you can go on the internet and find, uh, you know, outcries for, from, from Obama when he was campaigning before 2008, that he would take special care of protecting the rights of whistleblowers. What happened? Under Obama, 
more whistleblowers were uh, prosecuted under the Espionage Act than in the terms of all presidents before him combined. Uh, we said at the time, this is extremely serious because this is the, uh, 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 a, a step in one direction and one direction only. They will go after whistleblowers on, or, and call them spies and, you, and abuse this, this uh, espionage act. Then they will come after journalists. And unfortunately we were right. And it was not until the abuse of the Espionage Act against Julian Assange that, that, uh, that the, the chilling effect of it really hit in. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is, so it's part of a trend. And yes, the, uh, it is all part of the same fight for truth and human rights. One last question. So you, you talk a little about that, but in thinking about the worst case scenario regarding Assange and and the consequence, how, wh what would be the consequences of that? And, and so because of that, why is it so important for, for political progressive forces, even governments? I, I, I saw you met uh, Gustavo Petro in Colombia, and, but other also Lula will, will, will take mandate in January. Why is it important to fight back against this, as you said, horrible trend? Well, the case against Julian Assange and Wikileaks is a test case. It is a test case of our resolve, but it's also a test case by, by the forces that we are fighting, the evil forces, on how far they can take it. It will set a precedent on how, uh, how governments will deal with the media. If they are, if they are successful in, uh, in, uh, in extraditing Julian Assange and put him up on trial uh, as a spy and lock him up for uh, you know, for the rest of his life, that will send a signal that they can go on the same road elsewhere, anywhere in the world. And it will put in jeopardy the safety of all journalists everywhere, including in Colombia, where we just came from, and including here in Brazil, uh, where we're hoping to get uh, manifested support from uh, President-elect uh, Lula. And there's a realization, a strong realization, that uh, that uh, this is the case, and the danger is there. There is a misconception that we are just fighting for Julian. Julian is a friend of mine, and certainly I would fight for him in any way, but he is just the face of a, of a, of a huge problem. It is, it is about press freedom worldwide. It's about human rights worldwide. It's a part of our general pushback against the attack on decency, and the core values uh, that constitute this thin layer that, that is our current civilization. If we don't push back, we're gone. Thank you very much, Sarafsan. Thanks for having me. Esse foi mais um BDF Entrevista Internacional. Recebemos aqui Christian Rafson, editor em chefe do Wikileaks. E mês que vem estamos de volta. Na próxima semana você vê o BDF Entrevista, que vai trazer mais um tema relevante da política nacional, dos temas nacionais, da discussão do Brasil de fato. Até a próxima.